This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. In this lecture, we're going to look at internal controls. If the auditor thinks that the internal controls are working properly, then they're able to rely on them and do less testing of the numbers themselves. So we need to understand what controls are, what the auditor does in terms of recording them, assessing them, and then finally testing the controls that are in place at the client. So it's those issues that we need to look at. First of all, we need to understand a little bit about how you record the controls at a client. So recording the client's accounting systems. And you may be asked about the different methods of recording that can be used by the audit firm. And the principal methods are narrative notes, flowcharts, and questionnaires. Narrative notes means that you simply make a list of the procedures the client has in place. And these will be okay if you are looking at a very simple business. The advantage of having narrative notes is that the staff don't need very much training because you can say to the audit staff, go and speak to the credit controller and make notes about what they do to make sure that bad debts are actually collected in, um, if at all possible. So these narrative notes at the end of the day are very they're useful if you have a very simple business. These days, of course, you don't have many simple businesses that need auditing. But if there is a very simple business model, perhaps you can need you can use narrative notes. The trouble is that they're not very disciplined, and so it may just read like an essay that someone submitted at school. So more common, again, is that they would use some kind of flow charting, and that's what they would use with most businesses. So this would be useful for a complex business. The disadvantage is that the audit staff need training in flow, to flow chart techniques. You won't have to prepare a flow chart or interpret it, but if you've seen them, you'll know that you have columns for each part of the business, so on the sales cycle, they'll have a column for the order, a column for dispatch, a column for invoicing, a column for recording. So it's very easy to see how the system fits together and where the different documents flow. So that's the normal method of recording. And finally, sometimes they use questionnaires. So questionnaires, again, are lists uh, the way I describe it is lists of all possible controls. Again, it can be a bit unthinking. You'll see when you study the notes, they're called internal control questionnaires. And so on the sales cycle, there'll be a list of all sorts of controls that could be in place. Then the audit staff have to sometimes physically tie the client down and go through the list of control and say, do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have this? And the client goes, yes, yes, no, no, no. Then the auditor can go back to the office and assess which controls are in place. And if on balance, it looks as if they've got a decent uh, control system in place. So in our um, course notes, again, you've got a little bit more detail about each of those. So I won't read those points out there, but there's some more detail there about how narrative works, notes work, how flow charting would work, and finally, about questionnaires. The most common form of questionnaire is the one that's called an internal control questionnaire. So that is where they will ask, again, effectively, um, is this control in place? Are invoices sequentially numbered? Are all auditors are all orders recorded? Um, is there a check on the sequence of orders recorded that day? So you can see these control lists there. Again, you wouldn't be asked to write a list of them, but the general spirit is that yes is a good thing. 
The problem I think with questionnaires is they may not cover specific controls the client has which actually work better in their business. Either way, the first stage is to say, I must record the system, understand what controls are in place. I can still remember being a student a very long time ago and thinking, well, I can learn that, but I don't really know what controls are. So let's go a step ahead and say, what are the different parts of an internal control system? Now, when we talk about an internal control system, we talk about five components. There's a mnemonic for this that might help you to remember their names, but don't do any highlighting yet. The mnemonic is CRIME. C-R-I-M-E. It doesn't put the controls in the right order, but actually it's one way to remember them. The C of CRIME is actually down here, it's control activities. So that's the C of crime, that one down here. The R is risk assessment. The I is information systems. The M is monitoring. And finally, the E is the fact that about the environment in the first place. So strictly control environment. I suppose you could say crim key instead of crime, but that doesn't seem to work quite well. But we'll just talk through those components. Um, control environment is very, very much high level. And it may be that you work in a business that's highly organized, in which case they've probably got a very good control environment where on a day-to-day -day basis, things just don't go wrong. So what sorts of things constitute control environment that is the foundation, as it says in the notes for everything else, is where you can see in particular, again, there are things like an ethical statement. Perhaps the ethical statement is um, posted again against each PC, each workstation, so the staff are aware of it. It's very clear that those charged with governance as to their response as to they set down the tone of the business remember those charged with governance are above day-to-day -day management they're things like the non-executive directors the audit committee it's very clear again policy in terms of recruitment and things like that there are job descriptions for everyone everyone is very clear about exactly what they do Another way, again, of saying it is ultimately there is not chaos. So you need a very good control environment in the first place. The second thing is to make sure and think about whether management have got a process in place for identifying, assessing risk in the business. That's principally business risk, which isn't really in our syllabus, but when they look at the business, if it's an airline, they're saying, well, what are the risks that could affect us? Like a pandemic, again, like poorly maintained planes and so on, that they've assessed those risks, assessed their size, assessed their likelihood. The third element is to say, do they have a proper information system, which these days would probably mean, again, a very strong information technology environment. So I need to understand how that process works. So what we've already said, isn't we, that we've got the board of directors setting the tone of the business. Management being able to assess where their risks lie of not achieving their objectives. Proper information system in place so that, you know, we are aware of the financial position of the business at any time. Management are aware of problems immediately. Monitoring of key performance indicators, those sorts of things. So that system has been put in place. Fourthly, that within each of the transaction cycles, again, there are control activities that have been predetermined. 
Now, these we're going to talk about a lot in just a minute, but the control activities is the detail of the controls in place. First of all, you need a proper environment. It's like closing the door to make sure no one can come in and interrupt your meeting. And then you carry out your activities, which are things like reconciliations. We'll cover them in a minute. And finally, the board needs to be able to look back and monitor the whole system and make sure again that the control system is working. And that may well include an internal audit function and again, internal audit may well be um, there to monitor and help to monitor that controls that are set down are actually adhered to. So running a good business and keeping it under control, a decent control environment in the first place, make sure people are clear about what they do. Management are able to assess the risks. There's a good information system in place. Individual control activities have been predetermined and are, are, um, are adhered to. And finally, again, there's a monitoring process, again, like internal audit or the audit committee, standing back and making sure that everything has been adhered to. So you may be asked for the five components of an internal control system. Remember crime and make sure for the exam you could write perhaps a sentence about each of them. The one that we need to take to much more detail, though, is this concept of control activities. Now, control activities are much now more drilling down to errors in the financial statements. As it says here, I am now concerned about things being wrong in the accounts at the assertion level, so as an example, an assertion is something like completeness. An item in the P&L is sales or revenue. So I might say, what are the controls in place to confirm completeness of sales, completeness of revenue? An assertion is something like existence. What controls are in place to make sure there is existence of inventory, that the, exist, the inventory recorded in the books is the inventory that's actually physically there at the moment. Again, there are various categories of these, and I'll talk about some of them now, or introduce some of them. One of them is segregation of duties. In particular, if you took something like the purchase ledger, then someone in the business would be responsible for making decisions about what to purchase for the business. Later, someone has to pay the supplier. It is very important that those two people are different people because otherwise, in theory, if Barry makes the order and Barry pays for the order, there could be fraud Barry could order stuff for himself and then initiate payment. So what would be much better, isn't it, is that Barry makes the order and then later someone else, Carrie, initiates payment. It's not all about fraud. A lot of it is about error. You know when you prepare a set of accounts in your accounting exam, you can never make your balance sheet balance. And your tutor looks over your shoulder and said, look, there's a transposition error and you say, how silly. So a lot of it, again, is about you know prevention of errors. Sometimes in smaller businesses, segregation of duties is not always possible. The second type, again, that I'll mention now, very easy to understand, whatever it is, needs to be authorized. On the payroll cycle, we need to authorise, don't we, things like overtime. On the sales cycle, we need to authorise credit limits for customers. On the purchase cycle, we need to authorise which, um, again, 
payments, all payments to some extent, but specifically payments over certain limits. So authorization, there are controls in place to make sure that someone responsible, again, is actually authorizing whatever it happens to be at that stage in the business process. Reconciliations, a very, very, very important term. You've already met bank reconciliations. Um, so bank reconciliations in your earth studies for other subjects. We'll meet later within this syllabus supplier statement reconciliations. Suppliers send statements every month and we need to make sure, don't we, that everything that's on their statement is on the ledger unless it's an error. There are also internal reconciliations within the business. So things like a payroll reconciliation, reconciling the amount that's being charged in the nominal ledger, again, against the amount that's ultimately, again, being paid out to the staff and for deductions and so on. So reconciliations make sense. Finally, again, <clears throat> you've got physical controls, which we understand, the lock on the safe, the lock on the door, the keypad to gain access to the department, and of course, IT or logical controls, <clears throat> which we'll be talking about much more in a later chapter. So we're saying that there are five elements of a control system. One of them is control activities and there are various types of control activity like segregation, authorization, reconciliations. These controls will vary depending on whether you're looking at revenue or PPE or cash at bank and so on. Inevitably, the auditor needs to be aware, though, of course, that sometimes controls will have limitation. Again, I'd make sure you learn at least the bold words and the, or you're able to explain perhaps four of these. They make sense. The client has to assess cost benefit. It might be that it's simply not worth putting the control in place if the monetary amounts are not significant. Even if Harry does something and Carrie checks it, there's still a chance of human error. Carrie might, you know, miss that particular transaction. Collusion, of course. It's fine, isn't it? For Barry to, to initiate the order, Carrie to process the payment. But what if Barry loves Carrie? In which case, there's a chance, isn't there, they'll cooperate. It's extremely rare, but it happens and we have to be aware of it. And sometimes, again, there's a chance, sometimes in a smaller business, but even in larger companies where the chief executive, if they're an unpleasant person and they like shouting at people, will just say, no, don't worry about that or you're fired. In addition, controls don't always um, apply to non-routine transactions. So there are controls over sales and purchases and so on. But it may be, again, that there are transactions outside, again, the normal business cycle. And perhaps there are no controls in place for it. Again, one of them that's mentioned in the notes is disposal of non-current assets, particularly if they're scrapped, because it may be that someone in the factory says that's broken, they stick it in recycling, they're not aware sometimes, because they work in the factory, they're supposed to fill in a form and notify someone who maintains the non-current asset register. So looking up here, as it says right at the top, we are always aware, again, that we will never ever eliminate the risk of error. That is why, of course, we will always have to do some element, again, 
of substantive testing within the financial statements. It will always have to be there to some extent. Remember, substantive testing is testing the numbers. There's a nice reminder, isn't there, about while we're thinking about this down here, when it reminds us about the audit approach. So what we're doing is looking at the control system, seeing if it's well designed. If it's badly designed, we'll just have to test the numbers by ourselves. Lots of expense for us and then the client. However, if it looks like the controls are working well, then we can do a more cost effective audit. And that means we will reduce the level of numbers or substantive testing. But it's one thing to say the controls are well designed. It's another thing to say, well, they actually work. And that means we need to test them. Clearly, if you say to someone, well, do you do a bank reconciliation every month? They'll say, yes. It's like saying to a child, do you do your homework every night? And they say, yes. Have you brushed your teeth? Yes. But the truth is, they haven't, have they? Unless you've observed them in the bathroom, that's the child, of course, brushing their teeth. So we need to make sure we not only check the design, but also, again, then test the controls. And what we might say is step one, is it well designed? Step two, now let's actually go ahead and test. There's a little bit of audit theory coming out now with some relatively new jargon. So you should be aware of the difference between these. So make sure you learn these definitions. Be prepared to write a sentence about each. First of all, direct controls, direct controls, as it says, are sufficiently precise, to detect, prevent and to correct misstatements. Now you then say, well, what does that mean? So as it says further down here, it tends to be things in information system, tends to be things in control activities. So examples, or an example of a direct control would be something like a bank reconciliation. A bank reconciliation, if done properly, will help to assess whether cash at bank is fairly stated. So the auditors may well be testing those. Also, at a higher level, they'll also be testing indirect controls. As it says, those are those that support direct controls. And that are that much more controls in the control environment, again, risk assessment and monitoring because if I know that internal audit is operating properly I've got comfort that they will have chased up things like bank reconciliations so don't lose too much sleep about this we'll summarize what to write in the exam in a minute but I'm just saying indirect controls an example of an indirect direct control would be again looking at things like the, the performance of internal audit. So it's things which are linked, things which are linked again to, again, risk assessment, control environment and monitoring. Let's imagine it's a four mark question. A mark for the, the definition in the first place a mark for an example. So if you can remember the points I'm underlining, because this is quite topical, I think you'll be okay. Direct controls, sufficiently precise to prevent, detect misstatement, often associated with control activities, example, bank reconciliation, two marks. The other one now, indirect controls, Support direct controls. Example, monitoring again. Example again, 
There you are, internal audit. That's plenty. But what? that's the theory. The practice is to say, well, how do we actually write tests of control? What sorts of things are we doing? So controls, let's think about a couple. Controls would be things like the staff must count the inventory in pairs. That's the client staff. So that they're both, one is counting, the other one's checking the count of the first one. That's a control. Supplier statement reconciliation. That's a control. So it's those sorts of things. So what sorts of things would then constitute tests of control? Now this is the, well it all needs learning. But this point down here is so important again that it's very important indeed. So frequently, test of controls would involve the verb inspect. So I'm going to write a test of control. Inspect, sample, because we always test samples. We don't want to test them all of bank reconciliations. to confirm. Now, if you do anything, you evidence that you've done it in some way, manual or electronic signature. And again, presumably, they've then been reviewed by someone else. So I'm just going to say, to confirm, signed by someone as evidence of review. So Barry did the bank reconciliation. Barry's manager, Matilda, then reviewed it and signed it. So notice the structure of my sentence. <clears throat> Inspect to confirm what? I'm not inspecting to confirm a number. That's a substantive test. I'm expecting to observe a control. The control is the signature by the manager. I'm making sure that control is in place. Now, you could, could you use observe for a bank reconciliation? Observed Barry doing the bank reconciliation. Well, it's a, it just sounds a bit silly, doesn't it? You'd feel like a bit of a walnut. Wallflower, I think that's the phrase. But observe, observe, well, observe the inventory count. There we go, We've made, we're making one up here. Observe the inventory count. To confirm, <clears throat> there are two staff counting the stock. I'll just put counting. Notice again the words in the middle of the sentence to confirm. After the confirm, here's the control. The control is that there are two staff there doing the count. So observe to make sure the procedure is being carried out. <clears throat> Clearly, there is a, a little bit of an issue there because staff know when they're being observed. So, well, that's just something you have to live with. Finally, although this one is not very important, um, uh, really, um, the clients don't like this very much, re-perform, do the control again. <clears throat> well, easiest way to visualize that <clears throat> is at the count. Harry has counted the lemons, there are five. Barry has counted the lemons, there are five. I'm the auditor, I will now count the lemons as well, five. Clearly, by me redoing what they've done, it will confirm that actually their control of Barry checking Harry, or whoever it was, was in place. Or another way, another one might be to re-perform, <clears throat> re-perform, a bank reconciliation why the clients already done it so they're standing you with their uh, looking at you with their mouth open and you're saying i'm going to do my bank reconciliation and then we'll compare the two so the client staff don't like it we have to say tough sausage don't write that in the exam either Reperform the bank reconciliation to confirm <clears throat> that it's been properly performed. 
by the client. I'm just making sure they did it properly in the first place. Notice the sentence structure to confirm every single time. Sometimes people say to me, well, could I use a different sentence structure? Watch my lips. No. I'll say that again. No. No. You always write it using that sentence structure and everything will be fine. Um, it does say <clears throat> underneath a very important point about a dangerous thing, and that is this word inquire. So ask the child if they've done their homework. Ask the bank robber if they robbed the bank. You know, it's just useless. So it does actually form sometimes part of controls testing, but it would always have to be combined with other things. So this verb inquiry, I think, is very dangerous in life, but also in the exam. So if you're asked for four tests of control and you write four beginning with inquire, how many marks will you get? Probably nothing. So don't do it. Inspect, observe and re-perform. Trust me, that's how you pick up the marks on basic tests of control. We'll talk about other techniques again a bit later. Just recapping so far, what are the key things that we've mentioned so far in this lecture? Coming back here, quite a lot of things. We talked about the methods of recording the system, principally flow charting for many businesses. We talked about the five components of control, control environment, risk assessment, information systems, control activities and monitoring. We talked about some examples of control activities. Um, we said that controls, you cannot rely on 100%. And then finally, we've been talking about some types of test of control, of verbs inspect, observe and re-perform. At the end of the audit, there are two outputs. One is, and this is what the client wants, is an opinion whether the accounts are fairly stated. In addition, we also tell them about things that have gone wrong with their control system, and it's really adding value to the audit. So further down here, as it says, we will report back to management on internal control. When I was an auditor, it was described as adding value to the client. So I will make sure that I notice, again, deficiencies, and I then communicate them, sometimes to those at the top, those charged with governance, sometimes, if it's less significant, to those lower down, management. And we would do that in a management letter. A management letter, at the end of the day, will really summarise what the problem is. It could be that you've got badly designed controls, or it could be controls that are not working properly. And of course, if management address these things, it might save the money. It will certainly save the money next year when we do the audit, because we'll be able to rely more on their controls and less on testing the numbers ourselves. So here's the kind of thing in a management letter. Traditionally, they present them in three columns. You have a problem. This is what the consequence might be, and this is how you can fix the problem. So let's just have a look at what they've got down here. What's a problem? A problem is that you noticed that invoices are not cancelled when paid. So it's probably done electronically now, but traditionally the, the chief accountant, when they signed it, they did agree to pay a particular supplier would have a big rubber stamp and they'd stamp the invoice paid to make sure they didn't pay it again. In a particular business, they don't do that. What's the implication of that? What's the impact of that for management? The impact, of course, is you might pay more than once. 
And of course, this gets management attention because they say they hate wasting money, or I hope they do, and finally say, well, this is what you could do. So you should mark or stamp the invoices paid to solve the problem. And that's the idea of the traditional management letter. There we are. So we've had a look at controls. Make sure you learn the five components of the control environment that you, sorry, of the control system, that you've got examples of control activities, that you know the difference because this is topical between direct and indirect controls, and practice writing tests of controls. Find the control, put the word inspect, observe, or reperform in front of it, and see if you can finish the sentence. I think you'll be fine. And there we are. That is our little lecture around controls.